All right, we'll see how this goes. I'm playing around with some new equipment here, so uh, let's hope it, uh, it all goes well. Today, we're actually going to switch subject matters, uh, and we'll talk about macroeconomics, more on that in a second. Of course, it is customary after an exam to say something about it, so I will say a little bit about that. Oh, by the way, for today, we have chapter 15 up and running for you, uh, for your practice and enjoyment. Uh, so, as it happens, uh, Ishii and I have managed to grade everything and get all the exams in order and all of that stuff. Uh, you probably have noticed that your scores are not yet released on either Gradescope or Top Hat. This is because we have one or two stragglers, right, who are, as we speak, maybe taking the exam. But by the end of the day today, the scores will be released, and I'm hoping you will do exactly what we did last time, right? That is to say, look at all your materials, look at the answer keys, see where you've been treated unfairly, or maybe, you know, even where, where your exam has been graded incorrectly. We miss things, you know, there's a lot of uh, grading to do and we try to get it done uh, quickly. So we're gonna check all of that and then, you know, in a week or so, once all the dust settles from that, I will decide on a curve and I will get all of your latest grading stuff up into Blackboard, right? And the, uh, the grade book there. So that'll all happen and at that time, you know, as, as we sort of progress through the uh, corrections phase, we can talk about, uh, you know, the exam and all that stuff and what the questions meant. Uh, suffice it to say, I'm not going to say a lot about, you know, going over the exam and all that um, because we, we want to keep moving uh, more on that. So one thing I will say is it looks like the way our schedule breaks, our last class is going to be Thursday the 12th of December and our final exam is a week later, uh, the 19th. So it's, I say, in-class exam at the schedule, you know, we will we'll do about the same thing we've been doing all along. Of course, the exam uh, calendar gives you two hours, right, for an exam period. And the timing is a little bit different, right? The timing is, you know, I believe this one starts at, is it 11 to 1 maybe? So it's a, it, it occurs a little bit later and it's a little bit longer. But, you know, we can figure that out as we get closer. Uh, but it, all the information is there. And I did, by the way, look at this uh, site. Um, and so this should be where you can, you know, this is not just for this semester, but for any semester in general, you can always figure out when your exams are here. So maybe we'll just look at it here and check. We are Monday, Thursday, 10 a.m. So there's my information. 11.30, you see the, uh, the final. Of course, we have ample time to talk about it, but I'm just putting it on your, uh, your radar screen there. And of course, we'll do the last class, which I guess is the 12th, will be a review. Uh, the other thing I might say is one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight original lectures. So as it happens, it looks like I'm, I'm kind of excited about this. It looks like I might have one or two lectures at the end of class where I can do some special topics after we talk about uh, uh, macroeconomics. Some of the favorite special topics we've done in the past include matching markets, auctions, right, and also uh, what was efficient markets hypotheses. And, uh, how they interact with things like the stock. So the good news is a lot of what we say about macro will feed directly into uh, at least one of those topics. Uh, so I, I kind of, I think we've done a good job with our material so far, and it looks like our, my plan, my overarching plan for the semester is, is coming together pretty well. So anyway, continuing on, I feel like there was one other thing I was gonna say about all this, but I can't think of it, so um, I'll just keep going. Oop, what happened there? Okay, I'll just dive right in. Um, you'll see I have a pretty uh, big slide deck today. I don't think we'll get through all of it, but I really don't have much of a feel for uh, how much we will get through. So um, I'm just gonna jump right in and uh, start talking about macroeconomics. Oh, and one thing maybe to stow this into the exam a little bit, it is a fairly sharp break in the material here, right? So instead of talking about individual markets, we talk about macroeconomics which is about these big variables uh, and how they inter interrelate. Um, and I will say that this, you know, it's, it's often the case that students, even at this point of their economics careers, uh, sort of are gravitate to micro, the stuff we already talked about, right, market structure and all of that, or macro, which is about what we're going to talk about. And it's kind of nice for a class like this because a lot of you, and I've gotten a lot of emails over the past couple of days, 
concerned about your exams and all of that stuff, it's kind of nice that this is such a nice break in the material, right? It's kind of a, a chance to start something over uh, and you know, show you have a mastery of you know, basically half of economics. So in that sense, it's kind of a neat, uh, a neat uh, time in the class. So if we wanted to tie it back to everything we've talked about before, we might say that this is the big picture perspective on pr productive and allocative efficiency. Right? That is to say, we want to make things in our economy as efficiently as we possibly can, right? and we want to all allocate them to the highest uh, value in use to the degree that that's possible. And you might say that what we do in macroeconomics is we look at how well the economy on the whole is doing that, right? Now, mechanically, the way we do this is we look at the relationship between these large aggregate variables, right? These summary measures as to what the economy is doing. So, you, you know, most people have some familiarity with some of these. So we'll talk a lot about gross domestic product uh, and gross national product, almost the same thing. Uh, we'll, of course, even think about adjusting this in various ways. So I've added some per parenthetical remarks there. Per capita gross domestic product, that's, per, that's a, a GDP per person. Right? We often call it GDP. And we'll also talk about real GDP. And one of my big objectives today is hopefully to tell you what we mean when we talk about a real variable. Right? That's a variable where we've removed uh, the price effect, I'll call it, or we, we've removed the impact of inflation on the variable. So we talk about things like that, gross domestic product. What is it? We'll get there. Interest rates, right? Uh, there's a whole bunch of interest rates, but we'll talk about how they sort of move in general with our, with our overall economy. We'll talk about inflation, and prices, right? How high or low they are or how they're changing as it happens. And the unemployment rate. And of course, really what we're trying to do here is A, understand where, what all of these things are, right? And how they're measured. That's a big part of macro, by the way, is measurement. But also, how they interrelate, right? We're going to build a theory as to how they all uh, work together or move together. So you might even, you know, in, in that way, that's a small basket of variables that we're going to talk about. But of course, we'll also talk about you know, the stock market, uh, housing starts, maybe jobs, job creation. These are all things you hear about in the news. And most of what we can say about those first four things in my list there you know, we can relate them to the, uh, these other sorts of variables. Um, so I don't know if it's a surprise or not. One of the recurring themes in the class is that uh, we can think about a lot of things using supply and demand. Well, our venture into macroeconomics will be no different, right? We're going to think about how we can construct supply and demand for the economy. And this is basically, you know, how people buy things and what they want and how we produce things and how the economy you know, and how those two things come together, what people want, what we can make. Roughly speaking, you know, to, to short, you know, this isn't a mystery, so I, so I might want to signal where we're going here. We're going to treat Q, right, the horizontal axis uh, of our diagrams, as something like total output, right? Output across the entire economy. And we're going to treat P, which is something, you know, which is usually a price. We're going to treat that as prices in general, right? So we're going to take all of our markets effectively and collapse them onto one supply and demand diagram and modify it in certain ways that it captures what we think are the salient features of the macro economy. OK. So you know I like to do this, and I'm a, this is uh, no different. Uh, the big macroeconomic questions or features of them people have been thinking about for a long time. And macro, as much as, you know, maybe more so than microeconomic theory, uh, is a function of things that have actually happened in the real economy, right? Uh, hopefully you'll see this in a couple slides here. Uh, that is to say, people look at the real world and they say, well, why is this happening? How do we understand what's going on? And this has been going on for centuries, right, if not millennia. Uh, and people have always sort of wondered about this. Uh, one basic question we'll talk a little bit about is what, maybe we'll start here when we start with theory, what role does the amount of money play in determining things like interest rates and prices? So this was a big question maybe starting in the, uh, the age of exploration, right, where we had this massive influx of gold coming from the colonial uh, parts of the world flowing into Western Europe, countries like Spain, right? 
uh, during this time. And you know, all these weird things started happening. Prices started to change along with the price of, with, with gold. Interest rates started bouncing around, right? The rate at which you could buy and, or you could lend and uh, borrow money. Uh, even other weird stuff started happening. So a lot of people in Spain were wondering, well, why is it that most of our gold winds up in the Netherlands, right, over time? Uh, things like that, right? International flows of gold. So people had all these big questions about how everything was going and the associated questions about well, when prices change and when interest rates change, is that good or bad, right? Um, what is the desirable level of interest rate or, and or prices? So that's somewhat like the questions we're going to gradually build an apparatus to understand. So another big example, a big macro policy question, uh, concerned the corn laws, which was you know the beginning of the 19th century. The Napoleonic Wars had come to an end, and of course this was a period of time where you know, basically the European continent was blockaded. And in Britain, um, one thing that happened once these wars ended was this whole new international market in agricultural products came online, right? So back in those days, corn referred to just about everything. You know, wheat, actual, well, actual corn, um, any sort of thing you might grow, uh, any crop you might grow. And so the question was, well, the prices of these things might go down. Should we do something to support the prices, right? Um, are they too high? Are they too low? What can we do about these price uh, changes that are bound to happen, if anything, right? Um, we still have questions like this. You're probably, th maybe your wheels are turning and you're thinking about some of the questions we have now about, you know, the role of tariffs and prices and all of that in our economy. And so once one interesting thing that's also happened over time, it's always been going on. People have always had recessions and downturns in economic activity. Um, and so we're going to try to understand, well, what produces a generalized glut in, eco in uh, economic activity, right? Why is it that we have these things called recessions, right, where suddenly, you know, people lose their jobs and the economy starts, starts uh, performing not as well as it once was? Why does this happen across the board? And people have always wondered about this as well. So I have some neat examples here. Um, you know, of course, and you know, once again, my overarching lesson here, using my Mark Twain quote, uh, history doesn't repeat itself, but it often rhymes. Much of the things that happen today have been going on for centuries. So panic in 1797, there's this big real estate, I believe, investment bubble that burst at that time. What is a bubble? Well, hopefully we'll get into that a little bit. Uh, and that caused a whole uh, economic panic, which led to this big downturn in economic activity. Um, in 1857, there was a big panic, and it in part spread rather rapidly through this contagion effect. The newly created telegraph right, came online around that time, and that was a source of propagation maybe of this whole panic that, or this whole uh, recession that happened there. 1893 is fascinating, and we're going to talk about this uh, in a wholly unexpected way. It's going to be great. I'm looking forward to it right now. I, I'm dying to say something about it, but I'm not going to. 1893, we had this big question, you know, of course, this was the time where the United States was getting bigger by the minute, uh, you know, expanding westward and all of that stuff. Farmers, all of these things. Country was just growing. The problem was our money supply, our supply of gold was not growing, right? And this had all sorts of consequences for prices and interest rates. It caused a lot of regional strife. A lot of people got very angry at Northeastern, the Northeastern banking industry and the rest of the country. Um, it's interesting, the problem just kind of went away uh, because what, 18, late, later 1890s, uh, there was the Alaskan gold rush, which kind of alleviated the shortage of gold problem. Uh, but we have this notion that you know, there are all these different causes and that everything is sort of interdependent, right? That one thing can happen in a financial market and this can touch off a whole set of consequences for the real economy, right? And of course, we've seen that play out over and over again, even during your lifetimes, right? In 2008, you know, we had the housing market thing happen. Uh, going back before that, 2000, uh, maybe I'll tell you my big investment story about the, the dot-com bubble, right? I guess a lot of you probably weren't born when that happened. Um, but that was another interesting macro phenomenon, another setback. Um, so interdependency, right? We sort of start with this idea that everything, you know, you see that these events maybe trigger these big macroeconomic events, if you want to call them that. And then the question becomes, well, 
how do we think about the overall economy as a whole? And so people have been doing this for a long time too. So none other than Plato, way back in ancient Greece, uh, thought about this as one of the keys to uh, economic activity. Right? One of the reasons why we come together as a society uh, is so we can specialize in trade. Right? I can do what I'm good at, you can do what you're good at, and if we all live in a city, uh, we can engage in trade. And part of the aspect of this is that resources flow around between all of us. Right? Uh, well, Plato made certain things of that. Fast forward a couple millennia, right? Uh, you think about the Middle Ages, the Renaissance and Enlightenment. Uh, now we start to get these national economies, right? Uh, we had Spain before, there's Britain. Um, they're thinking about things like trade and commerce and how much gold we have in England versus how much gold they have in Spain. Um, you know, these international competition, and of course the whole mercantilist uh, era, right? And an associated question that popped up then was like, well, how well are we doing here in this, in this race between uh, nations? And so now we have this problem of measurement, right? We're talking about how everything is interdependent, but how do we actually measure how well we're doing, right? It's not a difficult problem. One aspect of this is that you have to sort out some very basic notions as to what it means to measure something. And one thing I'm gonna emphasize today as we move along is, I don't know if it's a problem, but the difference between stocks and flow variables, right? Uh, that is to say static quantities and things that happen over time. And indeed, I'm hoping to convince you that really the, the way we should measure national wealth, for example, uh, is using a flow variable, right? And I'll get into what that means as we go along. Now, one great leap forward in all of this was the Great Depression, was kind of the watershed event in economics. I have a million things to say about this, and you know we're gonna we'll say a lot about it in due time. I have some some of my conspiratorial theories. Well, I don't know if they're that, but I have these questions that go along with the Great Depression and what really happened. Suffice it to say, it was an enormous economic downturn, the biggest that we've experienced, perhaps in you know certainly in the history of the United States. It was big. It was a long-lasting uh, economic event. Uh, and it posed a lot of puzzles because it didn't seem like it was resolving itself. For our purposes, a lot of stuff came out of the Great Depression, including the way we measure economic activity on the whole today, right? our system of national accounts, and also theory, right? Macroeconomics as an independent discipline was really born with the work of John Maynard Keynes and so-called Keynesian economics, which was a Comp more or less comprehensive macroeconomic theory, which described, uh, well, for one, starting with this point first, it was a very financial theory in that it described how and why financial money markets interrelated with real economic activity. Um, and it also had these other aspects that made macroeconomics distinct. So I have this thing, the fallacy of composition here. What is that? Well, that's this notion that when you take everything and add it up, the whole somehow behaves differently than each of its constituent parts. Right? So one example of this, and we'll assess it later in class, is savings, right? So from the perspective of an individual, savings is a good thing, right? But it might not be a good thing from the perspective of the overall economy, right? And that if we all save, it removes money or spending power out of circulation, and this might do something for our macro economy, right? And so that's what we get out of Keynes is an explanation that kind of binds all of these things together and creates this uh, theory of why, how we can get stuck, right? Um, our economy in general can get stuck. And of course, the rest of macroeconomics, it's really, it's really a fun story to tell, kind of plays out you know, in historical fashion. Every time we figure something out, something new happens, but it turns out this new thing is really something that happened you know, before, uh, but now we have to modify the theory theory to include it and it's a kind of a it's a fun uh, discussion to have okay circular flow back to back to this idea that you know the the economy is some sort of flow um, what this means is that really what we're talking about is the amount we produce and the amount we earn as we produce things uh, works over time right that is to say, you go to work and you earn your money uh, every day. You do some stuff at work. You make some things, maybe. Uh, you get paid for it. Well, that's something that occurs during a day or a week or something like that. 
right? And we're going to care primarily about these flows, right? That is to say, what happens over time, right? Um, and we'll care about things like yearly output or yearly income, wages per hour. By contrast, you might say, well, you know, if you think back to the mercantilist period, this maybe reflects this idea that what matters Right? It's not how much a country, how much gold a country has at a given point of time. That's just the stock variable, right? It has no time dimension. What matters is how much we can produce as a nation over the course of a year. Right? That's something that we care about. That's a better way to measure wealth. And so one of the first people to really hit upon this idea, this fellow by the name of Francois Quenet, right? you see he lived 1694, 1774. Uh, he founded the so-called physiocracy or the physiocratic school. And this school believed that, well, yes, wealth was a flow, right? Um, that was the best way to think about how wealthy a country was. His example was France. Uh, but also that almost, ever, almost all value came from agriculture, right, or the land. Uh, we have a different view now, and we'll talk about how we think about value, macro, macro economy. Um, so it's interesting, he was actually the court physician, right, to the, uh, to the French kings. He was the court physician, and his primary specialty was blood flow, right? So he was, circulation was something that was very much uh, in his, uh, on his mind. And so he thought about uh, wealth much in this way. So I actually have an example here of uh, uh, think his primary instrument for thinking about flow, it was the so-called tableau économique, right? And it looked like this. It's a difficult thing to understand. Uh, so I have a little table on the, uh, you know, another picture of it on the left. I'm not going to quiz you on this or anything, but it's just fun to uh, think about this. And you can also even imagine, you know, starting from ground zero, this is how someone thought about this. And it might be very much the same way you might attack a problem. There's some other points of interest, all, you know, just right out of the... Uh, you know, right out of the gates here. So really what happens is every year, uh, the pe upper left hand, maybe you can see it, it's a little small, but it, where my cursor is, it says 600. What happens is the farmers of the world, uh, the productive class on my left hand diagram, they get some infusion, right, of grain, say, right? Now, what do they do with this grain? Well, they use some of it to sustain themselves, that's that, uh, the two billion loop going from the production class to itself. They create two billion in surplus, which they send to the landowners over the course of a year. And they buy one billion from the sterile class. This was the manufacturers, right? Uh, they just, in, in Kenney's view, they didn't really do anything. They just kind of tr transformed stuff that was given to them by the productive class. So, you know, the, you're in the, as you're going along, you grow some hemp or some wood and you give it to the, you know, the productive class, and they make it into something else, like a toy or a shovel or something. Um, but that doesn't really change the value that comes from the uh, production. So one, or from the productive class. So one reason why I like to mention this is because most of you are looking at me thinking, I can see it, you're, some of you are looking at me, and that's not quite right. Indeed, it isn't. And so we're going to have to, it's a nice way of sort of thinking about what really creates value and uh, wealth. And so you can kind of see this. This two billion uh, becomes one billion in purchases from the productive class on the part of landowners, one billion in manufacturers, two billion uh, goes back that way, one billion goes this way. So if you sort of look at this in a certain way, the only arrows, the, the, there's more arrows coming out of the productive class, right, or more bigger numbers coming out of the productive class. Uh, than just going in, right? Uh, you'd have to add up two billion, one billion, and two billion. The productive class is kind of making five billion in wealth. Everybody else is just whatever comes in also goes out. And so that's kind of what's going on here on the left-hand side. This amount goes to the productive class at the top, and then they buy, they they pay rent and they buy things. Well, in the in the process of paying rent and buying things, uh, that results in more demand from the productive class. And then we go all the way down. You can see here we have the sum of a geometric series. The key thing is that once we get to the bottom, there's 600 again, and that goes back in at the top, right? That becomes next year's sort of advance payment to the uh, productive class. So Kinney had this model of this balanced flow and how resources sort of 
uh, ricocheted around the uh, the economy. A um, couple things. There's a couple things I wanted to say about that. Uh, he had a very the physiocrats had a very high opinion of this table, you know, likening it to maybe you know an invention on the order of like the wheel or gunpowder or something like that. Uh, that's one kind of interesting thing. Uh, the other interesting thing is you might begin to see, a, uh, if you know anything about Karl Marx, uh, socialism and stuff like that, where you analyze things in terms of classes. This is an antecedent, right? And Karl Marx certainly was stooped in a, uh, this sort of economics and what followed. But that's the idea, is that you break the economy up into different groups, right? Classes, in this case, and think about what happened. So Karl Marx, writing a century later, you know, kind of got rid of the productive class and just talked about, you know, maybe capitalists and manufacturing, basically, or workers. But the same, uh, you know, the, the beginnings of the idea of the. So, the way we can think, we don't think about things this way, but maybe I'll give you a quick example. I don't know why I settled on lumberjacks here, but let's just sort of think about what happens if you were a lumberjack. Uh, you have this dual role. This is true of anything you might do, by the way, as both a consumer and as a worker. Right? And as an economist, we would understand this as you are both providing a resource to the economy and at the same, t at the same time demanding resources from the economy, right? So you go to the lumber, you go to, the, you go to work. You, you know, an example of this is you create some lumber, right? The sawmill then ships that lumber to a, uh, you know, paper products or a wood company. You know, they make paper, uh, they make uh, pencils and all that stuff out of the stuff that the wood they get. And then that's transported to, you know, Staples or Costco or whatever. More on Costco later. Um, and that goes to stores in the form of pencils and papers, and furniture, whatever, right? Well, while you're working at the sawmill, you get paid some money, right? You get compensated for your labor. And you take that labor compensation. I, I almost might just say you take that labor, right? And then you go and maybe you buy school supplies, right? At Costco or Staples or whatever. Well, those wages go to the retailer, right? The retailer uh, takes uh, you know, some of that stuff and also buys pencils and papers from the producer. The producer, of course, purchases the raw materials from the sawmill, which is where you work, right? So in some sense, what you're doing when you work is you're creating the stuff you're ultimately going to buy. And that's kind of how the circular flow works. Uh, you know, it's, a little, it's much more complicated today than it was back in the day of Plato. But that's kind of the idea. And if you sort of squint at this, right, you can see that what's happening is the products I say here, I should say resources, resources and products, are kind of going in one direction, whereas the payments are going in the other, right? So the payments kind of, uh, you can think about money is flowing in the opposite direction of the resources. It's easier to see in a picture. So we don't break things down the way Kinney does today. Uh, we typically think of our economy as composed of two types of entities, right? Two classes, if you want to uh, think about it that way. Firms and households, right? So who are households? Well, you can, you know, that's your, your family. That might just be you, whatever. Um, what do you do in this uh, version of the picture? Well, what you do is you take all of your resources that you have. You have maybe, everybody has labor, right, that they can bring to the market. That's a resource you supply to the market. But also land, right? Land is owned by people. Uh, and capital. Capital is owned by people. What do we mean by capital? We mean uh, wealth or money that you uh, have saved up. That's also a resource. Now, you, you might think it's weird. You might say, well, I don't bring my, my capital to the market. But when you put money in the bank, what does the bank do with it? The bank takes that money and lends it to businesses who use it to buy machinery and you know, sign leases and all of that stuff. So the channel's a little different, but that's the basic idea. We think of these things as going through factor markets. Uh, that's one way of signaling that we think about the economy as composed of various factors of production, right? And what are factors of production? Machinery, land, labor, raw materials, right? The different big classes of things you can use to produce output. So we have factor markets for all of these things, right? And that's what we think about. So households bring all this stuff to the factor market. Firms go get it in the factor market, right? 
So firms wind up with labor and land and even entrepreneurship you can think about as a factor. We're gonna talk a lot about that as we move along. Um, so on and so forth, and the firm makes this into goods and services supplied, which then go into goods markets, right? That's where you, you know, you're making the, you're selling your labor to make lumber here and being bought over there. Um, and then households take their money and buy these goods and services, right? So that's kind of how this, how we think about the flow working uh, in a modern setting. Now, I said this about uh, money flowing in the opposite direction. What I might have said is payments, right? And so what do firms do? Well, as they're hiring resources, they pay uh, rent, they pay wages, they pay interest on any loans they have. And profits, of course, are also a payment, right? That goes ultimately to the owners of the firm, the stockholders, right? Um, so that's what firms bring to bear in the factor markets, but it ultimately goes back to households, and that's where you get your money, right? And you use that money to buy goods and services, right, in the goods market, which firms supply there. Right? So this is our circular flow. Now, one thing I haven't accentuated here is that you, when you're talking about a flow, or how big a flow is, you have to add a unit of time, right? You have to say, well, what are we talking about? If I wanted to say, you know, X amount of things happen in this flow over the course of, of a, you know, a year, then it becomes an interesting thing. Right? You have to think about it as having a time dimension. But one thing you might want to do is, or you might want to sort of think about the macroeconomic aspect of measurement, is saying, okay, well, we have this flow of stuff going around in circles here. What we, you know, an exchange vortex, I call it here. We might think about this as millions, if not billions or trillions of exchanges going on. Well, when rational agents engage in exchange, well, that benefits everyone. So if we could somehow measure the overall magnitude of this flow, we'd be measuring how many exchanges are occurring, right? And that would be a way of thinking about macroeconomics. Now, of course, uh, one of our uh, central figures in all of this circular flow will be the government, right? Um, and the government, you can think about as having really, I didn't mention the third, the third role here. I should have mentioned it first. The government provides a lot of services, right? Um, does certain things, buys services from people, provides them. Um, but it also has this function we can look at right on, right on, the, uh, on the circular flow. It collects taxes, right? Spends money, think about it that way. Uh, and also engages in transfer payments. So taxes, you know, we, there's all different kinds of taxes depending on the level of government and the source of the revenue. Uh, there's transfer payments. These are things like Social Security, welfare. We had the payment, the pandemic payment protection plan. Um, I guess I usually think about that as the PPP, but I've added a P here. Um, so the government does that as well. And it's not a small player in the circular flow. So I think I have here, just looking at the federal budget, uh, and indeed, I, I have an ulterior motive here today, right? And one of this, one of this, uh, one, this, one of these motives, I guess, or the ulterior motive, is to get you to start thinking about the numbers, right? How big are these things that we're talking about, right? Whenever we mention um, those numbers I talked about, output, inflation, prices, and all that stuff, how big are they, and what have they looked like historically? That's kind of uh, the secondary objective I have here beyond just defending them. So you can see here, or defining them, I'm sorry. You can see here we have this uh, uh, federal government. Uh, up in the right-hand corner, we have a simple little pie chart describing uh, the total outlays that the government makes, uh, about $6 trillion right, in the year 2023. And you can see it collected uh, $4.4 trillion in revenue. So it came up a little short. Right, about what, one one point seven trillion dollars short, right? Uh, well, what does it do with? How does that happen, right? And what does that do? That'll be a big question going forward. Uh, but you can see the composition of the uh, the spending there, right? About one point eight, uh, three point eight trillion of that spending is mandatory. What does that mean? One point seven is discretionary, and then yes, seven hundred billion dollars is just purely interest payments on uh, what we've borrowed. So here you can kind of see the breakdown once again as to how all these things 
where all the discretionary uh, spending comes from, where the mandatory spending. So mandatory Social Security, Medicare, Medicaid, other income security programs. That's really where the bulk of government spending is these days. And there's some that's on, you know, some non-defense discretionary spending, things the government can change year to year. And then there's defense, it's about $805 billion. Um, and then there's the interest payment there. So this is a neat little, you know, and I encourage you to do this, by the way. I have all these links in my lecture notes. Just browse through some numbers, right? Get a feel for how big these numbers are. And in some sense, this is almost like a, you know, almost like a public service maybe that, that we're doing here is that when you familiarize yourself with the big economic issues in the newspaper, you need to have some numbers in mind, right? What's big, what's small? Um, what are the orders of magnitude? So those are big numbers. This is actually, I'll fix it, this is 2023. Okay, well, slapping the government in there, you know, dropping out that monetary part of the picture, we can kind of put the government in the middle of the picture like this. And we can say, all right, well, what does the government do? Well, it buys stuff uh, in goods markets. It collects taxes from both firms and households. It gives transfers to both firms and households. What are transfers? Well, like I say, in the case of consumers, that's things like welfare and unemployment insurance. In the case of firms, that's you know production subsidies. You know, so we have uh, green subsidies now uh, for a lot of industries. That would be one of the transfers that the uh, federal government is giving. So that's what it looks like there. Now, I don't know if we're going to have time for this, but students often really like to talk about it. Uh, this isn't. There's also the circular flow going around the world. And you can break that down in a similar fashion. Uh, and so here I have a little example. Of, we have the US economy up there. And we have the rest of the world down here. So you know, we, we have people buying exports in the US selling imports in goods markets. Well, you might be surprised to learn that in balance with the good markets, goods markets are also these financial markets. Right? These are people who are lending to U.S. corporations or buying stocks in the U.S., right? Um, and, of course, we do the same when we invest in other countries overseas. There's a relationship between the financial and goods markets, uh, the overseas buying and lending markets, that is, and uh, goods markets uh, that we, we have to sort of consider. And, of course, we get something like, a, you know, you've maybe heard about this, this the so-called trade deficit. That is to say that we import, right, uh, more every year than we export. Well, there's another side of this coin, and that is the fact that um, there's a corresponding offset in the financial market, which means that people invest more in the United States every year than we invest overseas, kind of the offsetting. That is to say they save in the United States, if you want to think about it. Now, I'm hoping we have a little bit of time to talk about this, but if we don't, we have a wonderful cor a couple of courses where you get into this, uh, money and banking, 210, we have financial markets and institutions, and then we have international trade and finance, right? Great classes where you dig deep. You may have detected I'm a little uncomfortable. I get a little bit, I get a little bit weirded out talking about currency and, you know, trade. It's, it's one of my weaknesses. I'm a little self-conscious about it. Okay. So, first of all, we're, you know, as we move along here, we're going to talk about measurement first, right? Before we can talk about a theory as to how things interrelate, we need to think about, well, how are we going to even just measure, you know, say, output or the, the magnitude of this circular flow over the course of the year? Um, and the problem is we're talking about aggregate output here. How are we going to measure that when we have, what, millions and millions and maybe billions of different products produced in a given year, right, in the United States economy? How do we think about that on, on, you know, with one number, total output? Well, it's not all that different than what a business does, right? So, you know, we have this problem here. If you are, I have Kirkland, right? Here's, let's see if this pops up here. We have Kirkland, and you, this is, this is of course, the, the production arm of Costco, right? And you can see here that Kirkland is a marvelous corporation that produces clothing. Uh, you can buy some Kirkland milk. You know, you can wear Kirkland underwear. Uh, I have Kirkland brand chicken stock. Uh, there's even furniture, right? Uh, gasoline, it sells all of these things, right? How could we possibly think about how much stuff Costco makes with its arm here in a year? Well, 
the simple answer is maybe, and maybe you've sort of guessed it on your own, is to just think about revenue, right? You just take the dollar value of everything that Kirkland makes and you sum that up and that gives you a measure of how much stuff Kirkland has made, right? And we're gonna, we can do about the same thing for the United States economy. Of course, in so doing, we introduce all kinds of, uh, I guess, uh, follow-on problems. Um, and we'll get into those as well, and I'll define what they are in a second. So if you do this for Kirkland, you find that Costco right, takes in about $235 billion a year uh, through the stuff it's, so it's not exactly the same as Kirkland. So that would be their revenue. And that might be some amount or some measurement of how much economic activity Costco is engaging. We can do the same thing, right? But notice, of course, let me accentuate that there is a $235 billion per year right? There's the per year. So that tells you something about the flow of business going through Costco over time, right? Um, if I just said 2.35 billion, you'd say what? Over the lifetime, how is 30 years? Is that since Costco started? Is it yesterday? You need the year, you need the time component to make it make sense. So what we're going to do is you can think about the problem here as if we want to know how big our economy is, I'll go all the way back here to the simple one. What we're going to do is we're just going to want to measure the flow uh, around this, this thing. And the good news is we can pick a bunch of different ways of doing it, right? You can measure the flow, put another way, at all these diff different points in the circle, and you should get roughly the, the same answer. And indeed, that's in fact what the United States uh, uh, Accounting Office does, right? It measures the flow at different points, and then, of course, you get about the same answer. There's a discrepancy maybe, but... Um, that's kind of how you do it. So we have the, really the three methods. Um, the sum of expenditures on final goods and services is one way of doing it, right? And the sum of factor payments is another way of doing it. So put another way, that's kind of, those two are the most interesting, I guess, or the most intuitively interesting. If you think about the expenditures on goods and services, that's kind of like measuring the red line in the upper right-hand corner here. You're going to measure the flow there. And you can also measure the upper left blue line, right? And that would be rent, wages, interest. So you can put another way, you can measure total incomes during the year, paid by firms and businesses and all of that. Income here includes wages, uh, profits, rentals, all rental rates or rent spent. That's all in, uh, income for someone. Or you can think about how much people bought on final goods and services. So you're trying to, final goods can be a little tricky. You're just trying to isolate the fact that firms buy stuff in the course of production as well. But you, if you want to think about the circular flow, you don't want to have this, you don't want to sort of measure that stuff, right? Um, just what you want to measure it uh, at the top there. And so the last measure, value added, uh, is a little bit more complicated. That's kind of looking inside the firm and thinking about uh, the difference between what the firm buys to produce and then what it sells, the ultimate product at. So, for example, when a firm makes pencils, it buys wood and labor and lumber and all that stuff. So it pays money for actually just, sorry, just the wood and the lumber, just the goods that it buys. And out the other end comes a pencil. Well, it sells the pencil at more than the cost of the wood to make the pencil. And that's just a, in essence a value added measure, right? How much more can you sell bread, say, uh, over and above the amount you paid for the stuff you need to make bread, right? So that's not what, Kene would say that those values are zero, right? But we say that there's a value added there. You can add up those as well. Okay. So this measurement is important. And of course, it's very useful for us in assessing, you know, policies and how the economy is doing, how it's done over time and all of that stuff. Um, and this is kind of how we inform our theory, right? by thinking about how these things that we're measuring differ across place and across time. Now, really the big problem here, you know, I said, you sort of just, I said it and, you know, we accepted it. We'll just add up the value of everything created over time, right? I'm sorry, we'll just add up the value of everything that Costco creates. That'll be how much Costco does. We'll do the same thing for the economy. Well, the problem is our unit of measure is the dollar in those cases, right? And it turns out the value of the dollar is changing over time as well, right? So if we wanted to think about 
you know, how much stuff we've produced in the United States this year versus last year or the year before or 10 or 20 years ago, we have to take into account the fact that the way we're measuring everything, the prices, right, that we're using to add up uh, all of our goods, well, they change too, right? And we're going to have to make sense of that factor. We're going to have to confront that head on. The good news is we have a really good way of doing it, and it's actually kind of fun and interesting uh, how we go about doing it, how we settle on a unit of measurement. So, of course, this is of interest not just for measuring output of a firm or of the economy on the whole. It's also useful from a personal, personal perspective uh, because this happens to you as you move along, right? You, have, you earn a certain amount of money every year, and then you buy a certain amount of stuff every year. So maybe you get paid a wage, and then you also pay rent, right? Well, if you want to think about if this year is better than last year, you have to say, well, my wages went up. I got a raise. Good news. But my landlord raised my rent, too, right? And also gas prices change. So am I really better off? It's hard to tell. You need to have some unit that is constant over time or some way of comparing these things over time, right? So are we doing more? Are we better off? We need to grapple with this fact. So to begin doing this, right, just conceptually, we make a pretty critical distinction here between what economists call real and nominal value. Now, technically speaking, when you're talking about a real value, right, what you're talking about is what you can actually buy with that, uh, with the good, or with the with the money you have. So you have ten dollars. What we we don't really care about ten dollars, the number per se. We care about what you can buy with ten dollars, right? Um, all the different things you can buy. The nominal value is just the, you know, in the name value of something is just the ten dollars, right? So our big problem is we observe the values of things in these nominal values, dollars. What we really care about is the real value, what you can do with the dollars, right? Um, and so an example here to get you used to thinking to the kind of thing we're going to do. I have this, I was in Iceland this summer. Um, and so it's, it's a strange thing about Iceland. They have some fast, and, and you know, if you're an American, it's one of the great things. You sort of travel the world and, uh, you know, you say, oh, well, this is what fast food restaurants made it here, you know, um, and then you walk around. Iceland has about equal numbers of Americans and Europeans, and you can tell the Americans apart in a second, right, because all the Europeans have the very fancy hiking clothes. You know, the Americans are out there in their shorts, you know, walking around, smiling, right? Europeans aren't smiling at all, you know, generalization, but... Uh, it's, it's kind of a fun place to go. So you see uh, these different sorts of things going on. And one weird thing about Iceland, this is where I was, is that KFC is, there's not a lot of McDonald's around there, but you see a lot of uh, Kentucky Fried Chickens all over Iceland. I don't know why that is, uh, but it's just the way it is, I guess. And so here, we, you see here, you can tell what this thing right there is. It looks like a two-piece chicken meal. Right, and there you can see the Icelandic word for chicken meal. Um, and uh, kind of fun. You can see it costs here, this is my point here, is that in Icelandic kroner, it's about 2,769 kroners, right? Uh, in Icelandic uh, terms there. So the question then becomes, this is the nominal, right, cost of a meal, a two-piece chicken meal in uh, Iceland. How much does that really cost, right? You don't know, you don't quite understand what that means, right? 2,700 Icelandic kroners. Well, what you first have to do is translate things into a unit of measurement. Of course, here what I'm going to do is show you what the dollar cost of that meal is with the understanding that you know what a dollar can buy you in the United States right now, right? So in some sense, I'm doing one part of the translation to a real var variable, and I'm relying on your knowledge to do the rest of it. So. How do we go about doing this? 2769? Well, you don't really know. But they have these neat little things you can do here where you can just kind of see what the value around the world is. It was 2769. So if we translate that into uh, United States dollars, uh, well, you can see here a dollar is about 139 kroner. So that's about 20 bucks in American dollars, the, the, the two people chicken meal. What do you think? Expensive? Pricey? That's pretty pricey, right? Now you know, right? Once it's in a currency that you can think about these things, 
And this is true of Iceland, and there's a lot of, in, it's a fascinating place. Uh, one thing that's interesting is it's a small country. The degree to which automation has uh, sort of taken over a lot of uh, Iceland, so it's very hard to find any parking garages or parking facilities with actual people. They're all online, done by AI and stuff. Um, so it's a really, it's, a, it's interesting. Uh, more on that in a couple of classes, hopefully. Um, so we're trying to do roughly the same thing as that little exercise. Um, but we're going to try to do this not with just, you know, a two, uh, four piece or two piece chicken meal. We're going to do this with bigger groupings of goods. Think about how much they cost in general. Well, I guess that's kind of what a chicken meal is, right? It's a, it's a bundle of stuff. We didn't say how much the soda cost, the chicken or the, was it fries that it came with there? All right. So we didn't say how much each one of those individual things cost. We just kind of added up the whole bunch and then thought about that, right? So. That's something like what we're going to do, but for the entire economy, right? Um, and so one thing we'll get out of this is some sort of idea as to how much things cost, you know, 10 years ago, maybe 20, 100 years ago. We'll be able to think about those sorts of things as well. And of course, the real point of this is that we can think about how wealthy people really were, as, as an economist might say, in real terms, 100 years ago, say. Um, okay, so just to look at some things here, I haven't said a lot about how we're going to measure the price level. That's the mystery part of this slide. Um, but we can say a little bit about nominal GDP. That is to say, so if I was just to look at the, you know, the total dollar value of everything made in the United States in a given year, right? You know, the value of all the goods, so final goods sold, or the value of all the wages, interest, all that stuff paid. What would it look like over time? Just in pure dollar value. Well, we call that nominal GDP. The nominal, I call it gross national product here. Uh, gross national product, that's what this is. The amount of, there's some technicalities as to why it's gross, not net national product, and you know, how you measure these different things. You can just think about this as measuring the flow in the country. You can see that it, the numbers kind of look like this. This is roughly from uh, 1947, I guess. Well, it says up there, right? Uh, where does it say? 1947, January 1st to 2024, April 1st. By the way, this is uh, the FRED web website. Uh, it's made by the, uh, um, that's an acronym for something, but it's maintained by the Federal Reserve Bank of, uh, I guess, Federal Reserve Economic Data. That's what it is. Uh, maintained by Saint, the St. Louis Fed. It's a great source for all kinds of data if you ever need charts and things like that for uh, your projects. And so you can see here, maybe the, you know, if we look at how the dollar uh, value of all the goods and services produced in the United States has changed over time, well, one thing you might look at is that it's kind of gone up, 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 up over time, right? Exponential growth. That's one, I guess, maybe the single most important thing about this. And we're going to talk at length about that. But there's also these gray bars in there, right? And it's hard to, to uh, sort of detect how they work. Um, you can, but maybe you can see here they flat, the line flattens out a little bit. Um, and of course, then there's the big blip there in uh, 2008. That's where the line actually goes down. That's a recession. That's what these gray things are. You think about those as periods where GDP, or in this case, GMP, isn't going up as fast as it should be, right? Or as we would like, and maybe even goes down. That's a recession. Okay, well, one unhappy feature of all of this is that the price level has also been changing over time. And so this is the consumer price index. What is that? It's a way of measuring how much prices in general have changed over time. I'm going to get into this in a second. You can see that this is also going up, 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 right? Uh, there's some periods of time where it seems like it's going up a little faster. It's hard to tell because, you know, the, the overall scale of the graph kind of swamps everything. If you were to, maybe I'll do this. If you were to narrow it down, you'd see some more year-to-year -year variation. So you can see here we've had, you know, we've been a lot of talk about inflation. It looks like a little bit there. But what if I just kind of, one period we'll talk about a bit. doesn't look crazy as I thought it would. 
Uh, we'll talk about this 1970s period when we look at uh, inflation. I'm surprised this is as smooth as it, uh, as it is. For all urban consumers, okay, well, maybe that's why. But really, if you think about it this way, you can see that this is one way of thinking about this problem I've talked about. GDP is going up, but so are prices. Right? We have more stuff now than we did before, but we also have higher prices. So how do we know that our total value, or how do we know what fraction of this is actual increases in stuff made? Uh, okay, well, you know, to, maybe I'm giving you the punchline before the rest of the joke here, but I'll do it. Um, once we've removed the impacts of prices, we, we wind up with this series called real gross domestic product. And it looks like this. It doesn't look all that different. But you can see here that now that we've, we've sort of, by a trick I'll, I'll talk about in a second, we've removed inflation. You can see that, you know, this is in billions of dollars, I guess, billions of change. 2017 dollars, what that means is we've used the value of the dollar in 2017 as our base reference point for everything, right? So in terms of 2017 dollars, uh, GDP was down here in 1947, and it's way up there in 2024. So it's increased about tenfold, right? It's about 10 times larger in real terms. Well, I might say that the United States economy is making about 10 times as much stuff today as it was in 1947, right? Um, of course, that doesn't adjust for population. So one of our most useful measures here is so-called real gross domestic product per capita. And hopefully now you're starting to see the utility of this exercise. What is this? This is output per person, right? So this is something like what the typical person has, the average person has in the country at each point in time. And so, once again, you can see here, you always need a base year. This is $2,017. What this tells us is that the typical person in 2017 terms had about $15,000 in income or stuff back in 1940. So you can think about what that would mean if you had $15,000 today, roughly. Complications, but we'll get into those. What would that be like today, right? And then you compare that to what we have here, it's about 70,000. The typical person uh, in the United States today has about $70,000 of wealth, stuff, whatever. So that's increased, what, about six, 15 times six? Is that right? 30, no, about five, right? Five, something like that. So the typical person around, uh, around today, you might interpret this to mean, is about five times as, as wealthy as the typical person around in 1947 or something. So you often hear that each generation is about twice as well off as their uh, parents. This might be the source of a contention like that, right? That GDP seems, seems like it doubles every 20 years. So that's an amazing thing, and we're going to spend a lot of time understanding that, right? Why this has happened, where it started, why it continues, all of that stuff. That's one thing. The other thing is you can see here a bit more clearly, once we remove the price effects, we have this real GDP per capita, you can now see the recessions are kind of how I described them, right? The line actually goes in the downward sloping direction in these gray shaded periods. And this gives you a better sense as to how bad some of the recessions were. So that, that 2008 one was pretty bad. And you can see COVID there, right? Which was weird. It was completely different than any other, uh, but there it is. Uh, and when we put the depression on the chart, you'll get a feel for just how bad the depression actually was. Okay, so let's think about this a little bit. This is, I'm timing this out just about perfectly here. So we're going to think about a very simple example as to how we might calculate all of these things um, and how we might think about, you know, or what exactly is going on behind the scenes when we calculate real GDP. So here's a, a very simple example where I've collapsed the world into four different types of goods, right? And they have four kind of hypothetical prices, and we have two years. So here we have the amount of stuff that the, the economy produces or the typical person buys. Maybe that's better here. Now we'll go with the, with the amount of stuff the economy produces. That's here, right? So in year one, there was 20 units of food, 20 units of clothing, 30 units of shelter, and 15 units of transit produced across my hypothetical economy here. Continuing that theme, right, of starting with a very simple 
ridiculous example and then extrapolating from there. And they had prices here, right? These were the prices of each of these goods. So you can think about supply and demand or whatever going on in the back end. Well, then in year two, what happened? Well, it's what happens typically in the economy. There's progress, meaning we can make more of everything. So there's a little bit more food, clothing, shelter, and transit, but then there's also changes in prices, right? The prices of each of these things has also gone. So what we're going to try to do, what we're going to do is think about how we might make sense of this data and how we might think about removing price effects and thinking about real changes, uh, and maybe even thinking about how we might just how, think about how much prices have changed. So what I'm going to do is copy this over. Quickly, I should have done this before class. 20, 20, 30, 15, Q1, E1, 4582, Q2 is 22, 25, 32, 20, E2 is 5, 6, 10, 15. Okay. So, there we go. Um, okay, so year one and all that stuff. There we go. Okay, so the first thing we could do is we could calculate nominal GDP for my fictional economy. And the way we do that is, just as I've suggested, you take the quantities and the coexistent prices, multiply it all out, and add it up, right? So, for example, our nominal GDP, total amount of stuff produced in year one, is 20 times 4, 20 times 5, 30 times 8, 15 times 2. Well, what is this? 80, 100, E40, 30, right? I just add all these up, and we get... Somebody really quick with this out there? 210, 5, 550? 110, 1, this would be 210, it's 450? 450, thank you. Okay, so nominal GDP in year one, 450, I'll call it that. Nominal GDP year two, well, we can do the exact same thing. 22 times 5, 25 times 6. 32 times 10, 20 times 3, 22 times 5 is 210, 110, thank you, 25 times 6 is 150, 320, and 60, if we add up those, what, can someone do that for me, 690, okay, okay, so we might say that nominal GDP, increased from 450 to 690, right, over these two years. And indeed, the purpose of the example is to show you, sorry, it's not blurry there, is to show you that this two things are being confounded here, right, the change in prices and the change in quantity. As policymakers, as citizens, we came, care more about the change in quantity, right? That's a measurement in actual increased production. That's actual the economy doing better. So how do we get the price effect out of this? And just measure the quantity effect, right? The increase in actual output. Here's an ingenious idea. What if we just fix our prices at year one prices and then just use those for all the years, right? Then prices won't be changing and then we'll be adding up all of our output in the same unit of measurement, right? So we fix prices in one year and use that as we as our yardstick for all years, and then that gives us just the change in Qs, put another way, not the change in P, right? So when you look at these tables and you see the base year, that's what they mean. They mean what we're doing is fixing prices in terms of that base year, and we're letting the quantities that we observe change over time. So if we do that, well, of course, you can see here our net GDP, and, or I'm sorry, our, our nominal GDP will be the same as our real GDP in year one, 
because the prices are the same in that year. But now in year two, we're going to use the numbers here, the Qs, but we're going to use the Ps from this year, our base year. So we get 22, 25, 32, 20, but now we're going to use 4, 5, 8, and 2. And 22 times 4 is 88. Right? 22 times 5, 25 times 5 is 125. 32 times 8, I don't know if I can do that in my head. 256. Nice. 20 times 2 is 40, and so if we add those up, what do we get? Five hundred nine, five oh nine. Okay, so you can see here that now we we have a maybe a, a more accurate picture of how much our economic our economy has expanded, right? So the economy has grown from four fifty to five oh nine in real terms. That is to say, holding prices constant in terms of year one prices, our base year. Pretty neat trick, right? Now, there's a lot of difficulties with this, and you get into these in our macroeconomics classes, one of which is if, you, if you're looking over significant periods of time, the basket of goods that or the types of things people buy are different, right? So if we were going to compare 1950 and today, well, how does a cell phone factor into that uh, computation? Uh, we're not going to get into that much, but we talk about it quite a bit in macro. Oh, one last little thing. We might sort of look at this and we might say, well, this little trick won't just work for uh, quantities, but it might also work for prices. That is to say, maybe we can use this method, right, to figure out how much prices have changed over time, uh, independent of any change in quantity. That is to say, the pure price change. How do we do this? Well, what we do in this case is we say, all right, well, let's look at year, let's pick a base year, year one in my case I'll pick, and let's fix the quantities at these quantities, right? 20, 20 30, 15, right? Now what we're going to do is just let the prices change over time. So this is a defined bundle of goods, right? The amount of stuff that the economy typically produces, and if we let the prices change over time, we'll get an idea as to how this basket of goods is changing in expense over time, and that's a measure of the change in prices. So we might say that this 450 is a measure of expenditures in year one. Well, if we were to expend, you know, using uh, buy the same amount of stuff in year two, what would that give us? Well, let's see, that would be 20 times 5, 20 times 6. Right now I'm using these numbers with these prices. 30 times 10, and 15 times 3. So this gives me 100, 120, 300, 45, right? 565, okay. So we now could say something about how prices in general have changed. Uh, 450 to 565 is how much the price of the typical bunch of stuff has increased and is therefore a measure of how prices have changed over time. So using the same trick in two different ways, we're now able to measure changes in real output over time and changes in pure prices, pure price changes over time. In a nutshell, this is how we measure inflation overall, and this is how we measure changes in real GDP overall, right? Um, and it's a neat little application of how we do these things. So I think I have all the calculations here and what it all means. Um, and this is kind of what I just described. So I'm going to wrap this up today by saying this is great, but still we're looking at this change from five, what, 450 to 509. That's still a little hard to interpret, right? What we're ultimately going to want to do is translate everything to growth rate. This will make everything much easier to compare across people, across places, across time. Growth rates. What is a growth rate? It's the rate at which something changes over time in 
percentage terms. So you might hear something like inflation was 3%. What that means when we say inflation was 3% is that means something like over the last year, overall prices have increased by 3%. Uh, GDP growth was 2%. What does that mean? It means that the amount of stuff we're producing in real terms has grown by about 2% per year. We love these percentages because they don't depend on units, for one, right? And as such, they make a tremendous, uh, make comparisons very easy. We can, do a, we can do a lot of them. So it turns out there's three growth rates that will concern us. The growth of real GDP, the growth of prices, which is inflation, but also the growth of your investments. That's an interest rate, right? That says when you put $100 in the bank today and you have 105 a year from now, the growth rate of your investment has been 5%. So interest rates are all, everything is a growth rate. And on that note, I will, I'll leave you uh, to your devices. Look for your exam materials uh, later today um, because I'm hoping to get them back to you by the end of a uh,